Recently, we saw the release of not one, not three or four, but two games related to the classic science fiction flick of The Thing. And I got them both. And they couldn't be more different. One is a survival horror game where players work together in an effort to escape an icy tomb via helicopter. And the other is a survival horror game where players work together and, uh, and escape via helicopter. They are different. Seriously, I'm going to go into both titles, but before that, I've got two disclaimers. These jeux sont basés sur une franchise célèbre pour ses images grotesques et dérangeantes. Les deux derniers films ont repoussé les limites de la note art. Ainsi, certains des éléments contenus dans cette rétrospective peuvent être dérangeants pour certains téléspectateurs. La discrétion est conseillée. Also, I will be taking an exorbitant amount of time talking about the backstory of this franchise because the only subject I'm more passionate about than gaming is movies. If you want to skip the preamble, advance the video by about, oh, that much. To start, let's set the Wayback Machine to 1938 to introduce famous science fiction author and pseudoscientific quack solver John W. Campbell. And you probably don't know who that is because that is an image of Arthur C. Clarke. That's Asimov. That's Laurence Olivier. Try a little harder. I said he was a quack, not a literal duck. You're not even trying. He's the one grasping a cigarette holder trying to look like an actor from the 1950s. There you go. Outside of being the editor of one of the most famous short story magazines of the last century, Campbell dove occasionally into writing fiction himself, with arguably the pinnacle being the novella Who Goes There, conveniently having recently entered public domain. It told the story of an American research station in Antarctica surviving an alien menace they inadvertently release. In 1951, Archeo Pictures released a very loose adaptation calling it The Thing from Another World, the titular creature having been referred to as such in the original novella. It's a serviceable film from the time, though not particularly faithful, having replaced paranoia-filled horror with a lumbering Frankenstein-esque plant monster. They kill it via a combination of fire and electricity. Novel. Fast forward to 1982 and hot in the heels of directing Kurt Russell in the cult classic Escape from New York, Renaissance man John Carpenter, who apparently has neither shaved nor needed to adjust his mustache in over 50 years, decides to remake the classic film with the intent of following more closely to the source material. The film kicks off what would later be known as Carpenter's Apocalypse Trilogy, a group of underappreciated horror films including In the Mouth of Madness and a personal favorite, Prince of Darkness. The simplistically titled The Thing failed to resonate with either critics or audience in its day, discounted as a grotesque shock film with little to no enduring value. It is now considered one of the seminal works of science fiction since its release. I guess people were too enamored with E.T. The Extraterrestrial, which I kid you not, was released only two weeks prior. The franchise remained somewhat in limbo for many years until Dark Horse released an unofficial sequel, several in fact, most of which were less than stellar, but kicked off with an amazing two-issue series with seriously amazing art. Oh, and by the way, this is not a clip pulled from YouTube. This is actually from my personal collection. Jumping ahead to 2002, Computer Artworks and Vivendi Universal released The Thing for consoles and PC, a traditional third-person shooter with a novel infection mechanic where any acquired NPC may turn into a monster via exposure to the various threats in the game. There were mechanical issues, but overall it was good, once you ignore the fact that anyone and everyone in the game could turn into a thing except you. Finally, in 2011, a prequel film was released, but the less we speak of that, the better. 2017, and not one but two board games based on the original theme are announced. The first came from Mondo, yes, the t-shirt company. Infection at Outpost 31 and the only game to have secured the rights to use the original title. However, after the initial announcement, little emerged from this title other than a screenshot of its game board. Several weeks later, optimistic startup Certifiable Studios announced their Kickstarter for Who Goes There, taking its name and inspiration directly from the original story. As Carpenter's film was more faithful to the original story, these games can run concurrently without risk of infringement, despite numerous similarities between the two. And I mean numerous. In the end, The Thing, Infection at Outpost 31, came out first in 2017, with Who Goes There finally releasing in the summer the following year. Set in Antarctica, except for the 50s film, which was set in Alaska, a research base stumbles across an alien vessel buried in the ice, having crash-landed there over 100,000 years prior. The vessel is excavated, and several versions is accidentally destroyed, but what is more interesting is the apparent frozen crew member having survived to escape the vessel, only to freeze outside. A block of ice containing the specimen is expertly carved and carted 
back to the station for analysis. Turns out ice melts when warmed up. The creature awakens and wackiness ensues. To properly explain the details of the titular monster, I'll hand it off to the great Wilford Brimley. I'm Wilford Brimley, and I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about diabetes. Nope, not that clip, the other one. See, what we're talking about here is an organism that imitates other life forms, and it imitates them perfectly. When this thing attacked our dogs, it tried to digest them, absorb them, and in the process, shape its own cells to imitate them. Yes, turns out the alien is little more than an invasive organism with the capacity of imitating other life forms it consumes. It can do so aggressively via an open attack or imperceptibly on the microscopic level. Because the creature can exist within a prey's own cells, one infected need not be aware of said infection, going about one's daily affairs until the need to consume another forces the alien to reveal itself. Imagine acting a normal person and then noticing tentacles emerging from your stomach. You can still be you as the alien emerges from your body. How messed up is that? <laughs> What's even more disturbing is what could happen if the creature returned to being you. Would you also return to being you? This is not like Invasion of the Body Snatchers where a duplicate is made and the original shrivels like a deflated balloon. With the thing, you can still be you, acting in a manner against your character. In effect, the thing is not imitating you as as much as it is hiding inside you. Sounds like a great concept for a game, right? Firstly, let's look at the thing, Infection, at Outpost 31. Immediately, it's easy to notice its decreased heft, extending to its price tag, costing less than half of its mirror. Three stacks of cards, a handful of characters segregated into three different roles, a half dozen basic dice, and some average miniatures. Colored variously to match characters, save red, which is reserved for the three things, the dog, the spider head, and the big beast. There are some tokens, and that very ordinary looking game board. This game will not be winning any awards for production design. Even the cards are somewhat bland. To play the thing infection, okay, you know what? This is getting, that's a real mouthful. I'm just gonna call it Bob from now on. With Bob, each player selects a character from one of the stacks representing the three classes in, in the game. Each new player must remove a character from the most numerous stack, ensuring a somewhat even mix. Each player then draws five supply cards. The rest go on the board, shuffle the mission cards, removing those that don't apply to your player count, place those on the board. Then shuffle the room chips for each sector and scatter them across the rooms. Some have items, but some also have things the group must attack as well. If an item, you can retrieve said item, but place the item chip in the requirement board. Satisfy both items and open the next sector. The point of the game is to clear out the three sectors to summon the helicopter and escape, though some players are not whom they seem. Shuffle the blood sample cards and distribute one to each player. Guaranteed, one player will be infected. Form the rest of the blood samples from mostly human cards, but containing at least one or two infected cards based on player count. Place these on the board. Set aside the double-sided infection card on the facing based on player count. Place the Apple IIe computer on its starting space. Randomly assign the first player marker, which is a gun. Because who needs to be paranoid when you have a gun? Gameplay begins with the first player drawing a mission. If an event, activate it, discard, and draw another mission card. Events can be smoke, which can lead to fire and potentially destroy a room or power outages. When revealed, roll a die to place the matching indicator in the matching room of the highest unlocked sector. Fire can result in a destroyed room with too many rooms potentially ending the game. If a mission, the first player, also known as the captain, follows the guide to select a team. There is a number of players the captain must take along following requirements for departments listed on the mission. The captain selects a room with a chip within an unlocked sector, then moves the selected players there. Each player then selects one supply card face down and unrevealed. The captain shuffles the pool, then looks. If one or more are sabotage cards, they are immediately carried out. Afterward, the captain may swap a, uh, a supply card with one drawn from the pile. The cards are shuffled, then revealed in whichever order dictated by the mission. If a roll is required, the dice value of the pool is totaled. The captain rolls a maximum of six, then compares the result. Captains also all possess unique abilities found on their character board that can affect the mission. If successful, reveal the room chip. If gear, the captain takes the item card and if it fulfills an objective, place the chip on the objective tracker. Rope can temporarily tie up a player for a turn. Dynamite can adjust a die value by one up or down. A flamethrower can be used to force a blood test on another player. Add rerolls to a mission or outright torch a character, thus eliminating a player from the game. Accusing someone as being an imitation ends with each player setting the standard Siskel and Ebert sideways thumb, rotating to the yes or no designation. 
Yes, Majority, the player reveals his or her blood test and is removed from the game. A no, and the flamethrower is expended without any effect. By the way, torching a human would be... bad. If the chip reveals a discard directive, each member of the team may discard one supply card and replace it. And finally, if a thing, the players must fight it. Place the appropriate thing model in the room based on the phase. All players on the mission must hand in a card to the pool, just the same as a mission. But with these, it's a number of dice that matter. Sabotage cards are still revealed and dealt with immediately. The captain may still swap one card. The captain rolls up to six dice based on the total value on the cards. The captain must roll three of a kind or four of a kind to defeat the thing. The infection tracker displays these requirements, with rerolls available based on the phase of the game. If defeated, the model and the chip are removed. If not, the model is still removed, but the chip is shuffled with the rest and distributed across the sector again. So, that model of the thing? Turns out it doesn't do much. Regardless of how the mission ends, the players are returned to the rec room. A failure advances the Apple IIe up the infection tracker. If a fourth room is destroyed or the apple reaches the end, the humans have lost the game. The infected have won. The game also ends with the players attempting to board the helicopter. The final captain is selected by the captain that succeeded with the previous mission. A vote of confidence is made if confident the final captain is chosen. If not, play passes to the next captain who nominates another potential candidate. If two captains are rejected, the apple advances. I wonder what's playing on that apple. Your move, king to rook one. My move, rook to knight six. Checkmate. Checkmate. The selected captain gets to board and must select who else escapes, depending on how far the tracker has moved. The final captain may have access to additional blood tests. The final captain then selects players that then reveal their blood sample card to all players. This is a necessary mechanic to offset players that are not sabotaging missions in hopes of averting suspicion. There is a minimum number of players that must be chosen. Once players are selected, the blood samples are revealed. If the players on the chopper are all human, the humans have won. The only victory condition. Any other situation, including infection, destroyed rooms, or stowing an infected on board, and the game is lost. The things win. Obviously, this means that the game would appear skewed for the humans to fail, and you'd be right. If all this resonates somewhat, a tingle of familiarity, you'd be correct, as Bob shares mechanics with two other well-known games in the market, Dead of Winter and Resistance. And one would think the two would mix brilliantly together. And it should. Except Mondo apparently believes by mixing it, it means sewing together two creatures, like when Bart made the pigeon rat. It could have worked, but two mechanical flaws pop up, one based on player count. You see, Bob lists itself as, as four to eight players. At four players, you remove the five to six mission cards. Full disclosure, there are no seven to eight mission cards. At four players, there needs to be enough missions requiring three or fewer characters in order to glean enough information to at least have a snowball's chance in figuring out who the traitor is. It would be foolish if in a four-player game, most of the missions required all four players. There is literally no information that could be gleaned. Well, that's exactly what Mondo has done. There are only six missions in the entire deck that involve three, none with less, with the remaining 35 cards requiring the entire group. Additionally, with four players, the four or five player missions can be extremely difficult to pull off. It's almost as if the game is not intended for lower player count games. It would not have been difficult to make more three player missions. It's weird to feature such an obvious misstep. The other issue involves the end, revolving around the helicopter. <laughs> revolving. If one infected makes, on, makes it on board, human players all immediately lose. You can see where this is going. Although the initial infected player could make life difficult and encourage a lose state, that player, and especially those players that are later infected, could do nothing to impede the group, invite no suspicion, make it on the helicopter by the end, and lose the game. Or rather, win it for them. Unlike the other game, which offers the possibility for the humans to fight back, we'll get into that later, with Bob, there is no opportunity. As such, combine that with the issue of occasionally having to take an entire group on a mission, and Bob becomes a crapshoot in determining who is infected and who is not. Oh sure, if the game reaches the end early, there may be as many as three blood tests to hand out, but this is not common. And in a four-player game, there's still only six cards with three-player missions, making sabotaging the group easy. And if you believe that, a player can actually be forced to sabotage a mission despite being human, which is straight up annoying. It can happen. Be saddled with five sabotage cards or cards useless to a mission, and you'll draw scrutiny despite not being the thing. 
adding unwanted paranoia in a game, which in my opinion has enough. Another issue is thematic. With Bob, players cannot infect other players. Becoming infected is a random draw. Players have no capacity to counter or resist. Bob is about paranoia and is a simplistic game in that regard. I also found it surprising that being infected is a mandatory status. One player must be infected at the beginning of the game. But with more than five players, the situation changes, and Bob is not a bad game at that number. It's not expensive to boot. But now comes the juggernaut. Who goes there? Who goes there? Which will also hang a nickname to make it fair. Let's call it Doug. Where Bob is simple and austere, Doug is dripping with amazing art and impressive graphic design. Just look at this thing. I'll refute complaints about the box size. I love this thing. My fiance and I adore huge unboxings, and this one took us 30 minutes to repackage after the initial opening. We loved it. Full disclosure, this is the total infection edition resulting from the Kickstarter, not the base retail version. I did back this game, my personal copy. Obviously, one could accuse me for favoring this game to offering charity and being critical to its competition. And there could be some fire to that smoke. I wanted this game to be better. But sorry to spoil the ending, it's not. It could be. I mean, the game looks better. There's no contesting that, despite Doug looking somewhat cartoonish, despite the amount of additional materials. Doug is not a difficult game to set up, just as long as you box the game correctly. Lay the two boards, inside and outside, next to each other, shuffle the workshop and storage decks, yes, they're that big, and place them in their spots. Do the same with the phase one, two, and three decks, and place them outside. Each player sucks a character, places all but one stamina cube across the board, put the last in its upgrade spot. Gain five action dice matching a character's color, place the last on its upgrade slot. Place the bonus lock or die in its slot. If you packed your game correctly, these upgrade spots on the board should already be covered. Each player also gains their own personalized deck based on their character. Lay out the skill dice, shuffle the vulnerable cards, place the oddly shaped but awesome looking final die on the helicopter section. Place the experience crystals nearby, place the event board, shuffle the corresponding deck, and place it in the draw pile. Each player draws one card from each of the decks inside as well as from their personal deck. They can then select one location to place their character. Place the item rack nearby. The first player is denoted by a rank found on the character's card. Then, sit back, relax, because this game is going to take you three hours. I'm not kidding. This is a long game. There is only one mission with Doug, Survive. It's a resource management worker placement game, one employing the thematic infection mechanic related to the franchise. It manifests with vulnerable cards and infection clickers. And these are cool. Click one direction to reveal yourself as human, click the other way to reveal your infection. The initial infection, unlike Bob, is not automatic. It occurs organically through the game. There are 11 blank cards and one with a rather dramatic blood smear. Gain that one and you become the infected. Unlike Bob, this is it. The only infected is now up to that player to infect the others. But for some reason, you don't want to infect everyone. Which honestly makes no sense. Regardless, gaining vulnerable cards could be considered inevitable. Though I am curious if it can be avoided. Technically, yes, I just never heard of it happening. On a player's turn, advance the phase marker. If you move on to an eat round, at one point during that round, you must discard a canned food or draw one vulnerable card. If reaching a sleep round, bunk with someone without a vulnerable card, sleep alone, draw a vulnerable card. Bunk with someone already with a card, and you, and you two must share your infection status via clickers. Set the clicker, share the results privately, reset, and then return them. If you see an infected result, you're infected as well. If a player is outside the beginning of a round, they suffer a stamina drop depending on the phase of the game, 1, 2, or 3. Players reset their action tokens, and if they have it, they're lock or die. The current player flips over an event. Instant events occur, brace yourselves, instantly. The rest are broken up into red attack or blue setback cards. At any point during a player's turn, he or she must make a check with action dice. Players gain action dice based on stamina and gear, with modifiers for either red or blue. Roll that number of dice and hope for a number of successes based on the phase the players are in. One, two, or three. Considering you only get, at max, two dice from stamina, one must acquire and upgrade equipment and do so before it's too late. Oh yes, this is that type of game. You roll the skill dice with several other situations as well. Players each then play out their turn, spending actions, moving on to the next player when empty. 
Character boards are amazing. These, this needs to be said. Everything slots in, into their place, they're color-coded, and the available actions are listed on each card. One action is required to move one's character to any other location. Spend two actions to draw the top card from the deck corresponding to the location that character is at, or from your personal deck if you're inside. Build an item if possessing the required components for one action. Receive one card from another player for one action if you're on the same location. And if that player has a vulnerable card, one must show the other his or her infection clicker. Though you can roll a single skill die to resist this, spending additional actions on rerolls. If inside, roll a single skill die and gain one stamina on a success. If outside, do the same to gain one XP. Spend two actions to remove one strike from the boiler if inside, or from the door if outside. Spend one action but roll a single skill die, removing the strike on a success. Players could also gain strikes, by the way. Gain three and your character is killed. Remove from the game. Players that suspect other players can also spend five actions to attack that player. Roll skill dice equal to an attack. Every success inflicts a strike, potentially killing the target. Yeah, if that sounds dumb, don't worry, we'll get back to that. Healing strikes can only be accomplished by playing a first aid card, and these are not as common as you might think. Each time you fail an event, you can suffer a strike. If the boiler room blows, each player inside suffers a strike. If the vulnerable deck is empty and you are required to remove one, you also receive a strike. And let me repeat that if a character receives three strikes, that character is killed and that player is eliminated from the game. A three-hour game. Don't think it's common? I have seen two characters killed halfway in Phase 2 in two different games. By the way, if you are revealed to be infected, you can enact a similar attack to attempt to infect other players. The various decks can include gear, building materials, the latter of which can be used to build gear. Each player receives a handy player aid, and there are lots of items. Like Feast for Odin Caverna level of options here. Not only that, but once you possess an item, often it can be used to create better items. In this weird ice world of 1982 Antarctica, the scientists and engineers can literally turn a knife into a hatchet into an axe. They can turn a scarf into a coat and do so in a remarkably short time. Equipment not desired, or if, if a hand runs over five cards by the end of a turn, a player can dispose of cards in the bonfire, throw down a match or lighter, and the fire erupts if it has at least five cards, returning stamina to the group. However, this all occurs inside the facility. Outside is the only way to actually win the game. Drawing cards from the decks out here is where one can locate the needed helicopter bonus cards. You can also gain gear or suffer an attack from the thing, making an attack check to resist. Gain the helicopter cards, set them aside for the end of the game. Doing actions outside also nets a character experience. Seriously, this game has a fantasy dungeon delving level of player growth. 2 XP each time drawing a card, more so depending on what's on the card. This XP can be spent for free in a variety of ways. Gain an extra stamina, gain an action cube, or even this cool locker die, which offers an additional special ability, which when used is rolled and returned back to be used again next turn. These are unique for each character, as are the boards themselves. Gary has a gun, Clark has a dog, and these are all reflected in each of their personal decks. Copper's personal deck has more medkits, Kenner has more food. The boards even list what their decks are comprised of. This is an insane level of customization and variety. You can also unlock more inventory slots, and when all of that is cleared, you can gain additional helicopter points by dropping XP in the overstock. Did I mention Clark has a dog, and you even place his miniature in the dog receptacle? Which sounds somewhat inappropriate wording it that way. Finally, after an inordinate number of rounds, players can, potentially, finally reach the helicopter round. This is the only time that creepy die is utilized. The team leader, determined at the beginning of the game, is the first to board the helicopter. How the players choose to play is up to them. If the leader steps off, the next player boards to become the leader. The elbow point is to figure out who is going to board the helicopter and who is not. The group can determine by whatever means they wish, but when finally selected, each player calculates his or her helicopter value. Add up all your required cards, then add that to a single die roll. The entire game is focused on making it to the helicopter and acquiring enough bonuses. The end goal being a single value based on the number of players on the helicopter. The players reveal their infection status. Humans on board add their values together. A player or players revealed to be infected add their values together, but this summation is removed from the human value. If the human value is above the helicopter goal despite, despite this, they somehow kick the alien back onto the ice and escape without infection. If the alien reduces this number to below the threshold, it absorbs the crew and escapes to doom humanity. If the entire crew are human but still don't acquire enough helicopter points, the storm proves too great and the crew don't survive their attempted escape, 
a helicopter vanishing in the storm. Seems straightforward. However, there's a strange rule that the game felt to the need to implement. It came out because of a logical loophole to avoid a certain victory. With Bob, the rate of infection is controlled. One player at the beginning, another one or two through the, throughout the game, maximum. But with Doug, an infected player can potentially infect everyone, resulting in a situation where if the players are all infected, they can all share a victory of dooming humanity. It's a game, folks. Knowing this and refusing to remove the concept of a player infecting another player, Certifiable had to include a rule that if all players on the helicopter are infected, they lose the game. The game attempts to justify this obvious compromise by claiming the thing is still weak and recovering from its time frozen in the ice, splitting itself into so many pieces and mimicking other life forms, depleted most of its energy reserves, and it can't make the helicopter trip alone. Except if there's one human on board and the total roll bonus is under the helicopter goal, the thing infects everyone and escapes. It makes no sense thematically and is only included to prevent a complete thing takeover. But it also creates a situation where an infected player doesn't want to infect the entire group. In a standard game, an infected player would only want to comp compromise at least one other player and would have to resist the urge to infect anyone else. A huge issue when a large chunk of the game involves sharing materials to build the gear required to make it to the chopper at the end of the game in the first place. It's a sizable thematic flaw in the game that breaks by suspension of disbelief. And it gets worse. Unlike Bob, which features a very traditional betrayal mechanic, Doug technically has no betrayal mechanic at all. The game builds itself as a paranoia game, but one where you can't really determine who is human and who is not. The goal of the game for a human is to survive, acquire helicopter bonuses, and escape. The goal of the thing is to survive, acquire helicopter bonuses, and escape. As a result, there is literally nothing the infected player needs to do to generate suspicion. All players work together with the infected player possessing the bizarre objective of, of infecting only some of the characters. Not all. Not that it's easy to determine who is the thing anyway. The game features no mechanic to reveal who is infected outside of two cards two characters possess, both of which are buried in their respective personal decks. And if you select said characters, and if you manage to draw the card, all it can do is select one player to secretly swap your infection clicker with. Now, beyond the fact that this is thematically inconsistent, it also doesn't make any sense. Why would a blood test be secret? It's just another mechanical compromise the game makes that breaks the theme of the game. I've not seen such a pretzel job since going to last week's food fair. To make matters worse, it's difficult to even make it to the end of the game, let alone escape. With Bob, it's relatively easy unless the thing gums up the works, but with Doug, the game is hard on its own. With three of our games, the group never even managed to make it to the helicopter, let alone escape. And in another situation, a player was killed off halfway through phase two, and the group opted to quit rather than force the player to sit out the rest of the game, bringing us to the single biggest mistake Doug makes. I will state upon a soapbox for all to hear that the single worst game mechanic in tabletop is not roll a move, not skip a turn, but player elimination. Specifically where the game continues after a player is removed. I don't mind if a, where a game's fail state is the elimination of a single player. Many cooperative games feature that. But a game which can potentially force a player to sit out part of a game is a game I don't really want to play. It's a bad mechanic, especially in a game like this that can run as long as three or more hours. I won't dance around the point. This game is unplayable in its current state thanks to an annoying and inconsistent endgame mechanic and the fact it possesses player elimination. It is such a misstep in game design on Certifiable's part, I am seriously concerned about their second game stuffed, which I also backed on Kickstarter. Don't get me wrong, Bob also features player elimination, but that game barely runs 90 minutes and the only mechanic to eliminate a player, the flamethrower, only appears in the last phase of the game. Of course, it still exists, and an unskilled player could reveal himself as the thing early and be locked out of missions and potentially most of the game. But that's due to player skill or lack thereof. You can be eliminated from Doug without any input from you and have that occur early in the game. And this is frustrating not because the game is overall bad, but because the rest of the game is so good. The beginning rounds are enjoyable in comparison. Making gear, surviving encounters, it starts off so well. But then players start banging their heads against another issue Doug suffers from. Overt randomness, a complaint I have levied with other games. I find Pandemic difficult as much of a game is determined with the shuffling of two decks. With Bob, layout randomness is welcome. 
as those alter the format of a game, not its difficulty or length, leaving only three relatively annoying random variables to contend with, the shuffling of the supply deck, the shuffling of the mission deck, and the rolling of dice. With Doug, there's a few more. The workshop deck, the supply deck, the phase one, phase two, and phase three decks, each player's personal deck, the vulnerable cards, the skill dice, the helicopter die, and the event deck. That's insane. And not everything is useful. The phase deck possesses thing attacks. The workshop contains junk. And that's assuming the cards you do pull are useful. There have been situations where a player could not create anything useful, and by the end of phase two, hadn't created enough gear, meaning his death in phase three was certain. Remember, you need three successes on dice with a 50-50 success rate, meaning you should have at least six dice to generate a reasonable chance at success. And with only two generated by your stamina, the remaining must come from gear. Some players may just be luckier than others. And that's still not the end of problems. I mentioned the game's difficulty, but didn't mention that said difficulty greatly changes when you add two characters, Copper and Kinner. Copper possesses medical kits and Kinner has most of the food. The game even admits that playing with these two characters makes the game easier. That tastes like a flaw to me. My fiancé wanted to play the dog handler, another friend wanted to play McCready, meaning I and another player were forced to play the two characters that made surviving to the end of the game possible. And I want to stress possible. We've only managed to make it to the end of the game using these two characters. When trying any other combination, we have not made it to the end. There was so much going for this game. I loved diving into these decks and building items. I loved the early rounds, fighting off the thing and surviving random events. It's ironic that a game's worst mechanic, a game about paranoia and alien infection, is the one focused on paranoia and alien infection. The art style, despite being a little cartoonish, is incredible, and the production value top to bottom is some of the best I have seen. Every element appears polished. This is a great looking game, compared to Bob, which does honestly look a little cheap. Of course, as stated, Doug is more than twice the price. After all of this, both Bob and Doug both suffer from faults involving the implementation of their theme. Bob is the closest to getting it right, but the basic game is unoriginal and bland, and if you were to remove the betrayal and paranoia mechanic, what you have left is humdrum, derivative, it's a bargain title. Doug, on the other hand, is a much more enjoyable game, one where if you remove that same betrayal paranoia mechanic, you could still have a good game. In conclusion, neither game is perfect, and without homebrew rules, Doug is unforgivably flawed. Bob may win this round, though only provisionally. If looking for a game based on paranoia, you might want to give it both a pass. Now, let's throw all that negativity aside and homebrew these titles, because when you do so, something magical could happen. The more rules you use, the more that can be homebrewed, and that's what I think. As such, there is a lot more that can be done with Doug than with Bob. Since Bob and Doug feature identical themes and similar mechanics, it would be an interesting idea to share some rules between the two and see if these work as alternative forms of play. With Bob, employing part of Doug's infection mechanic would be an interesting concept. Combine the starting infection cards with the draw deck to form one deck. Players do not draw any at the beginning of the game. During play, if a group fails a mission or fails to kill a thing when it emerges, each player draws an infection card. None are replaced, they just accrue. If any are an infection card, you are the thing. If you have more than one card, when trading, you must offer one card to another player. You must hand over a human card unless you have more than one thing card, in which case you must hand over the thing card, infecting the other player. Likewise, I appreciate Bob's teamwork. So with Doug, if players are on the same space, when a player is forced to make a skill check, a player may add one die to, uh, to another player's roll, but this forces a sacrifice of one stamina. Each player can do this only once. Bob could use with a trading mechanic. At the end of a turn, a player may offer one of his or her cards in exchange for another. Players cannot show their cards, but if someone asks for a type of card, they can offer any card in their hand in exchange of one they are looking for. As for Doug, one of the more annoying mechanics is the single 50-50 die roll used at several points in the game. Players have no way of improving, which is odd since all the other checks in the game involve skill checks, which can be adjusted. So anytime the game asks for a single skill die roll, you can make a standard setback skill roll. Sure, it still basically gives you a 50-50 chance, but at least players possess some capacity of affecting their odds. Both games feature player elimination, but these are not hard to work out. For one, both games possess numerous characters to pull from. In Bob, as stated, player elimination occurs late in the game, but with Doug, I'd certainly recommend the killed player replace his character with a new one. The dead character drops his gear, the new player gains said gear as well as a number of XP based on the phase the game is in. 
3 if in phase 1, 6 if phase 2, and 9 if phase 3. The XP reward is required as throwing in a fresh character in round 3 will result in a nearly instant death. As elimination is no longer a thing, <laughs> I made it funny. You don't have to contend with twisted and compromising rules regarding blood tests. So if a character is eliminated, his vulnerable cards are returned to the draw pile to potentially keep the infection around. But now, blood tests work. When presented with a blood test, a character must reveal his infection clicker to the entire party. Depending on whose turn it is, it might be a good idea to kill that character before it has a chance to attack everyone. Just saying. Of course, as mentioned, there are only two blood test cards in the entire game, and the odds of pulling them are slim, assuming you play with the two characters with that card. So as another homebrew rule, I'd add that any character can discard both a match slash lighter and a med kit to force a blood test on another character. This action costs the same as an attack, five actions. Sorry, missed a space there. There you go. I'm not saying remove the thing completely out of the game, that's impossible. Rather, this is a parallel of the video game or major films where the main characters always thankfully avoid being killed off or infected. And it makes semantic sense as despite the number of characters, the outpost features at least double the number of characters. In the novella, the outpost numbered over 30. And with monsters already present in the game, it shows that some have already fallen to the infection. One could assume there are silent NPCs surrounding our players throughout the game. With Bob, it doesn't leave much game left as the basic architecture is relatively dull, but like all semi-co-op games, there is still the possibility the game can be lost. With Doug though, it's quite easy. The first thing to do is remove player elimination. There is a process above I just mentioned, however a better ploy would be to not kill a character at all. Instead, when a character receives his third strike, oh yes all the characters are men just making sure you all knew that, those strikes are all removed and placed on the helicopter bonus section. These are now counted as penalties to the helicopter bonus come the end of the game. The character also loses 3 stamina. No player elimination, no premature fail state. If you think this makes the game easy, well you'd be wrong, but Doug already has an inbuilt rule to adjust difficulty. The vulnerable deck. As stated around 20 minutes ago, ugh, this review is getting long, it was stated that when the vulnerable deck runs out, when forced to draw a card, the character is forced to take a strike instead and less forced to take both, in which case only one strike is taken. Thus, this deck can be used to adjust difficulty. Players no longer draw these cards for infection. Instead, this deck is depleted to represent group tolerance and stash supplies. When asked to draw a vulnerable card, it's simply discarded. This continues until the deck is empty. Employing the full 12 cards is easy difficulty. Try normal with only 6 cards, and on hard difficulty, use none, taking strikes from the onset. This may come as a shock, but Doug becomes an incredibly fun game once you ignore the very mechanic you think defines it. There is still an enjoyable survival horror game to be found here. Plus, employing these rules offers the opportunity for the game to be played with two players, though I would recommend controlling two characters each. It's such an obvious solution, I'm annoyed Certifiable didn't think to include it as an optional form of play. Admittedly, these homebrew rules were meant to address Doug rather than Bob. Bob works as a game, although one that's only above average. Doug, however, kind of annoys me. It could have been so much better. Both titles feature bizarrely identical in-game mechanics, weird since no entry in the franchise features escaping in a helicopter. I'm willing to pass it off as coincidence, but it's odd both titles involve it. No hidden movement, no investigation. As such, and this is an odd conclusion, the keeper between these is still Doug. Employing homebrew rules allows it to be played with only two people, and pure co-op can bring more people to the table. Bob is unplayable at four players, and it's rare I will have more than that. Doug is a preferred option, though provisionally. How messed up is that? The more broken game is the better one. This is Chris from DSX Machina.